So to make that a little bit tangible, why is it that we're able to make eggs? It's because our local environment here on Earth is very, very far away from its highest entropy state. If it were high entropy, the temperature would be the same everywhere, but that's not true. Here we are on Earth and we have the sun in the sky. The sun is a very bright, hot spot in a very cold, dark sky. That is what makes life on Earth possible, and it can all be understood in terms of entropy. The amount of energy we get from the sun is to a very good approximation and ignoring global warming, the same as the amount of energy we send out into space. We get radiation from the sun, we process it, we send it back, back out into space. But the energy that we send back out into space, infrared radiation, is much higher entropy than what we get from the sun. For every one photon of light that comes from the sun, the Earth radiates 20 photons out into space. And if you actually run through the math, that means we've increased the entropy by a factor of 20. And all of that, all of that entropy that we're increasing is because of all these processes around us every day that reflect the arrow of time. The fact that we are born before we die. The fact that we metabolize food to stay alive. The fact that we evolve biologically and things become more complex and varied over time. The fact that we remember the past, but not the future. The fact that we have this feeling that time goes by that's because we are accumulating an increasing number of memories because we're in the middle of this very, very low entropy configuration. We're taking use of this useful energy we get from the sun. We're degrading it and turning it into useless energy by increasing its entropy. If it weren't like this, if the universe were empty, if there were no sun shining on the Earth, we would very, very quickly, everything would stop. We would come to what is called thermal equilibrium. We would be in a high entropy state, nothing could happen, you could not remember the past, the future and the past would be completely indistinguishable. So the reason why the sun is a hot spot in a cold sky is because it came into existence through gravitational instability from a smooth cloud of gas in the early universe. It really is the configuration near the Big Bang where everything in the universe was packed incredibly densely but smoothly spread throughout space that immediately leads to our low entropy environment here in the solar system, which makes it possible for us to live in the way we do here on Earth. In fact, I want to go further than that. This includes such ideas as causality and free will. The fact that causes always precede effects. If I take an egg and I drop it and I get a splattered egg on the ground, you would not disagree with me if I said the reason why there is a splattered egg on the ground is because I just dropped one. Okay? But if I, let me see if I can say this correctly, it's hard even to, to sort of formulate the thought correctly. Uh, if I drop the egg, you would not agree with me if I said the reason why I had the unbroken egg is because I was going to drop it. That never works that way. There's certain things you can do because of the arrow of time, because there's no boundary condition in the future that says the entropy needs to be low. There's a boundary condition in the past that says the entropy is low. If you see this egg broken on the ground, if you didn't drop it and you just walk along and you see it, you can ask yourself, what will the state of the egg probably be 24 hours from now? Well, it could have washed away, someone could have cleaned it up, a dog could have come and eaten it, it could just sit there and sort of get moldy on the ground. There's many, many possibilities. There's no constraint. But if you say, what was the state of the egg 24 hours ago? Well, it was probably an unbroken egg. And you are able to draw that distinction. You're able to draw a much stronger conclusion about the past of the egg, even though the fundamental laws of physics are perfectly reversible, because there was a low entropy boundary condition. That's why we think that the past is fixed while the future is up for grabs. Given our current state and the low entropy boundary condition, we can tell you what happened in the past with a much higher reliability than we can predict the future. And it really is all a reflection of the arrow of time and entropy. It's showing up in our everyday lives and how we think about life itself. So it raises the question, why was it like that? Why was the early universe such a low entropy? And I can tell you, we don't know the answer. It is up for grabs. We are trying to figure this out. Different people have different ideas. So I'll run through three different possibilities, two of which are still viable, one of which is not. And I'll, you'll figure out pretty soon which my favorite one is. This is the first possibility that is viable, but I'm not going to talk about it. The, the reason why the early universe was so low entropy, so highly ordered, so unnatural, is just because it is. Because in addition to the laws of physics, there's an extra law 
a new principle of physics that says the early universe had a low entropy. For some reason, maybe Stephen Hawking or someone else with, with some clout in the cosmic arrangement says that the early universe just was like that and there is no further explanation we will ever think about. That is possible. That is not something that we can rule out just by sitting here and thinking about it, but it's a little bit unsatisfying. We would like to do better. We would like to have some explanation for why the universe was like that based on other laws of physics. We consider ourselves happy, but we can take some laws of physics and explain more out of them than we got putting into them. So this is definitely possible, but I'm not, I'm not a big believer in it myself. Here's another possibility. Maybe the whole universe is just a random fluctuation. So you remember Boltzmann, when he, when he showed how you could understand entropy by thinking about the individual atoms out of which something is made, he took the second law of thermodynamics, which until then had been thought of as a law, not just a good idea, but the law, and he said, actually, it's just a suggestion. The second law of thermodynamics is probably true. If you start with low entropy, usually you will go to higher entropy, but it's not absolute. And similarly, if you start with high entropy, if you wait long enough, you will fluctuate down to low entropy. There's a standard exercise in undergraduate statistical mechanics to take the air in a room like this and say, how long will you have to wait for the air to fluctuate just by the random motions of its molecules so that half of the air molecules are in, so that all the air molecules are in one half of the room? The answer is many, many, many times longer than the age of the universe, but if you have forever to wait, it might happen. So Boltzmann says, maybe the universe is like that. Maybe the universe is just one of those things that happens from time to time. And remember, Boltzmann didn't know about the Big Bang or anything like that. He thought the universe lasted forever. So he came up with a scenario which sounds exactly like modern cosmologists talking about the anthropic principle and the multiverse. He's trying to explain how we could be here in a universe that shouldn't really have us. According to Boltzmann, if you were in a natural configuration for the universe, you'd be in thermal equilibrium. He didn't know about the expansion of space, so to him what that meant was a thin collection of gas spread out equally through all the universe. But if that's true, you will eventually have these atoms, just by random chance, fluctuate into a low entropy configuration and then bounce back. And Boltzmann says maybe we live in the bouncing back after such a random fluctuation of stuff in the universe. So he says, there must be then in the universe, which is in thermal equilibrium as a whole and therefore dead, here and there relatively small regions the size of our galaxy, which we call worlds, which during the relatively short time of eons deviate significantly from thermal equilibrium. So you may have heard of the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is the idea that if we live in a universe where conditions from place to place are very different, we are only ever going to see places where conditions allow for the existence of life. This is actually stated in that way. It's not a controversial idea. There's no um, mystery as to why life in the solar system exists on the surface of the Earth and not the surface of the sun. The surface of the sun is bigger. It might seem unlikely that we're here on Earth, but the Earth is a lot more hospitable to life. If you have a theory of the universe where conditions are very different from place to place, there will be a selection effect where we can only see those regions that allow us to exist. So here's Boltzmann's multiverse. It's an infinitely big space. Most of the time, you're in thermal equilibrium. There's small patches where there's fluctuations. And occasionally, you get a really huge fluctuation the size of our universe, and that's where we live. And in fact, it was not original to Boltzmann. The, if I trace back in the literature, the furthest I can find is Lucretius in 50 BC. Just like Boltzmann, Lucretius was an atomist. He was a believer in atoms at a time when not everyone did, and he was faced with the same problem as Boltzmann. Why, if the universe is just atoms bumping into each other following random laws of physics, do we see all this lovely complexity and order around us? And Lucretius proposes, I mean, he did it in poetry, but he proposes the same kind of idea that Boltzmann does. He says, for surely the atoms did not hold counsel assigning order to each, flexing their keen minds with questions of place and motion and who goes where. Instead, they shuffled and jumbled in many ways, and over the course of endless time, they're buffeted, driven along, chancing upon all motions and combinations. At last, they fall into such an arrangement as would create this universe. This is exactly the scenario the Boltzmann had in mind, with the difference, of course, that Lucretius had no equations whatsoever to back this up. He couldn't predict whether it was very likely to have happened. And what I want to tell you is that it's the equations that get you in trouble with this scenario. This scenario does not work. It is ruled out by the data. 
If you make the assumption that the universe exists mostly in thermal equilibrium, and there are random fluctuations, and we are trying to be in one of those random fluctuations, that scenario makes a very specific prediction. And that was figured out by Arthur Eddington, a British astrophysicist in 1931. And basically the point is that even though there are fluctuations into lower entropy states very, very occasionally, smaller fluctuations happen much, much more frequently than large fluctuations. The larger the fluctuation, the rarer it is. So even if you say we, are, we couldn't exist in thermal equilibrium, we need a fluctuation big enough for us to be here, that would predict that we are in the smallest possible fluctuation that allows us to be here. So in particular, given that I'm here and that you're here and this room is here, this scenario predicts with overwhelming probability that as soon as we go outside the door, it will be thermal equilibrium. Everything will be smooth, the same temperature everywhere. So this scenario is falsified every day, every time you walk outside a door and look at the world around you. Eddington thought that the proper anthropic criterion was the existence of mathematical physicists. So he says... In this scenario, a universe containing mathematical physicists will at any assigned date be in the state of maximum disorganization, highest possible entropy, which is not inconsistent with the existence of such creatures. So given that we are all here, the rest of the world should be maximum entropy. And you think about it a little bit more and you realize, actually, I don't even need you guys to be here. To get me here, everything else should be in thermal equilibrium. So why are you here? And you keep going, and you reach a reductio ab absurdum, and you realize, I don't even need my body. All I need is a brain to fluctuate out of the thermal chaos around me long enough to have some thought process that looks around and says, aha, thermal equilibrium, and then dissolving back into the ooze around it. So this idea is called a Boltzmann brain. It was written up in the New York Times. There's an unfortunate uh, typo here. It says, Boltzmann's brain. This is not actually Boltzmann's brain. This is the idea that if there were nothing but thermal equilibrium around us, it would be much, much easier to have a statistical fluctuation make a single conscious brain than it would be this glorious universe we see around us with billions of people here on Earth, 100 billion stars in the galaxy, 100 billion galaxies in the universe. There's no reason to have all that stuff in the universe if this scenario is right. So this scenario is not correct. It is ruled out by the data. However, so once this uh, story appeared in the New York Times, uh, I was quoted in it, some other people were quoted in it, and everyone who was quoted in it got a letter, a stern letter, from George Wing, who was a 10-year-old budding cosmologist. He did not like the story, and I will show you his letter. <laughs> I don't know if you exist, but I do. I do not agree with your article, and I do not believe that mumbo-jumbo. If you do, well. It's a disturbing thought, but I know how to deal with it. I will not let the world disappear under my nose, but if you do, I can't say I'm sorry. <laughs> Sincerely, a 10-year-old who knows a little more than some people, George Wing. P.S. Some people have a little too much time. <laughs> the point is, the point that we need to emphasize about this, we talk about Boltzmann brains, thermal fluctuations out of the surrounding ooze. No one believes this. This is not a realistic explanation for the world around us. It's falsified by the data. We need to do better. But the problem is, why isn't it right? Why isn't it true that we are just fluctuations around thermal equilibrium? Thermal equilibrium is a state the universe should be in most of the time, so we need to figure out why that is not the world around us. My favorite answer, but again, it's extremely tentative, no one knows, we're trying to work on this, is that you have to go before the Big Bang. That just like we explain the low entropy state of an egg by appealing to the existence of a chicken, we can try to explain the low entropy configuration of our universe by appealing to the existence of a prior universe before our universe came into existence. And notice that the egg, sorry, the chicken, is not in any sense an intelligent designer. The chicken does not arrange the egg. It's the laws of chemistry working itself out in the chicken. What we would like to have happen is the laws of physics start with something before the Big Bang and naturally give rise to universes like ours. Let's see if that can happen. The first thing you're probably thinking of, I know that can't happen because other people have told me that the Big Bang is the beginning of everything. I've heard it be said that talking about what happened before the Big Bang is like talking about what happens north of the North Pole. It just doesn't make sense. And that's possible. It is possible that that set of words is correct. But we have absolutely no right to say that we know that is correct. The truth is, 
we have a theory given to us by this guy, Albert Einstein, about how space and time work,